Thank you so much uh, for inviting me, uh, and I came uh, from Japan uh, actually yesterday. Uh, so, uh, but I'm very excited uh, to be here to share some of my research uh, with uh, also a lot of a group of uh, uh, students. Uh, so I would, I would welcome uh, any comments and questions uh, if you have. Uh, so the title of my presentation today is uh, Building Ibasho, Creating Homes on the Move, the Experiences of Asian Immigrant Girls in Japan and the United States. Uh, this is the overview of the presentation. Uh, I will first talk about my personal border crossing experiences and then explain the concepts that I'm using in uh, this presentation, concepts of home and ibasho. Um, and then the methodology that I took um, for my research on uh, ethnographic field work in Japan and the, and the US, so talking about the Asian immigrant girls that I encountered in both countries. Um, and then uh, explaining about how, the, uh, how the, these girls negotiated displacement, especially at school and home, and uh, built uh, communities, built homes and ibasho locally and globally giving, globally, giving you some examples um, from that. And then um, the last um, presentation will be about what could we learn from these uh, girls' lives and what are some implications um, this research uh, might have. So how do children and young people who cross multiple national, cultural, and linguistic borders negotiate their sense of belonging? How do they create homes as they move across time and space, often without their choice? I have been pondering these questions through my personal and scholarly journey. I was born on a farm in rural Japan, lived much of my life in a suburb of Tokyo, and the rest of my life abroad in Indonesia and in the United States. At the age of six, I was brought to an unknown land uh, of the United States due to my parents' job and lived here for about three years. Since then, I moved back and forth um, between Japan and the United States, uh, exception of my two years in Jakarta, Indonesia, every three to five years. So I did a lot of border crossings um, across um, the US and Japan. And through that experiences, I navigated the omnipresent um, policing of various identity borders. For example, to be a good Japanese girl, what it means to be a good, Jap uh, a good girl in Japan. Um, also a pure Japanese. There is this, um, Pure Japanese, if you're a little bit strange, you will be, uh, there, there will be a lot of policing um, towards that. Or a typical Asian girl, what it means to be an Asian girl in the United States, which defined who I could be, who I could imagine myself to be, or who I should be. So my yearning for belonging in the midst of alienation without having to assimilate or segregate myself has evolved into my lifelong work as a scholar committed to the lives of people who inhabit the in, uh, ambiguous in-between space, in between multiple cultures, traditions, languages, uh, specifically immigrant girls. So it kind of came from my own border crossing experiences and I'm based, um, my research is based on my personal experiences. Oh, is it too? So a group of Asian immigrant teenage girls I encountered in Japan and the US is a product of a large scale uh, migration movement in the world. Uh, most of the girls follow their parents who decided to immigrate to a developed co uh, country, the US and Japan, searching for a better education and future opportunities for their children and family. Uh, the girls are border crossers uh, who literally and metaphorically cross multiple national, cultural, linguistic borders and struggle to navigate a unique borderland positioning where two or more cultures edge each other. So for example, they constantly negotiate what it means to be a girl both at family home, in the host society, and in their countries of origin. Where they also speak hybrid languages, a mix of English, 
Tagalog or Japanese in Japan, and that is their own um, in-between experiences. So located in this in-between space, these girls are negotiating outsider and insider experiences, dislocation and attachment, familiarity and unfamiliarity, tradition and change, and the local and global while simultaneously carving out a place to belong. So based on multi-sided ethnographic study of working class Filipina immigrant girls in Japan and Asian immigrant girls in the United States with Filipino, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Indian backgrounds, I explore how these young women in two different contexts negotiate displacement and carve out sites of belonging and attachment in an increasingly globalized world. And I focus on both Western and Eastern um, concepts of home and ibasho. So home is a Western concept and ibasho is a Japanese concept, so I'm calling Eastern uh, concepts, even though I'm not trying to essentialize or dichotomize West and East. Um, by doing that, I explore the impact of migration on, on immigrant girls and their potential role in an interconnected world. And the struggles and expressions of agency of these girls provide new ways of understanding what it means to grow up in times when borders and boundaries are becoming porous, uh, fluid, and diverse. Uh, I also um, plan to provide suggestions to transform often alienating and exclusive spaces into more affirming and empowering and inclusive spaces for immigrant students, for minority students. So from here, I will talk a little bit about the concepts that I'm using. So in this presentation, I focus on both uh, the Western concept of home and the Japanese concept of ibasho for these immigrant girls. Concepts of home and ibasho are crucial aspects um, of the lives of immigrants, right, who are dislocated from one place or who live in between multiple spaces. So for immigrants, um, home uh, for them are not only a house or a homeland, but they are also multiple, literal, and imagined spaces, places, and communities where they feel some form of belonging. And homes are not always comfortable places, but it could also be contentious sites, which could reflect both separation and commitment, or a place to escape to and a place to escape from. While various scholars have complicated and unpacked the concept of home for adult immigrants, there is a dearth of studies that focus on the meaning, negotiation, and creation of home for immigrant children and young people. These youth do not passively inherit homes constructed by adults around them, but have autonomy and agency in actively building homes in an interconnected world. So growing up, they are developing life perspectives, envisioning a future, multiple options of uh, their future options, and establishing secure yet um, flexible belongings. So I think it's very important to try to understand how children make, build, create, carve out uh, sites of belonging, right? Uh, places um, where they feel uh, comfortable or empowered. So that's what I'm trying to do um, here. And in furthering the analysis, um, I also employ this Japanese concept of ibasho. Is there anyone who's familiar with ibasho? Who has ever heard of ibasho? No, I guess not. <laughs> so this is, uh, but it's in, ja in Japan, it's, uh, everyone knows about ibasho and they often actually use this term in their daily lives. So this is not a term concept that are used only by scholars, but colloquially um, people talk about um, this. And um, this uh, ibasho uh, literally, it means a place to be, but in recent years, it has attached emotional meanings of security and safety and comfort or acceptance and recognition from others to a place. So it's not only a place to be, but you feel your comfort, you can be relaxed, you feel you're comfortable, you feel like you're accepted by people around you, right? So there's a lot of emotional meanings 
attached um, to this place. While home um, colloquially refers to a family home, community, and homeland, and which often colloquially, I think, uh, assumes permanency or structured spaces, the concept of ibasho captures informal and temporal spaces. So a bench where the child is sitting, this can be in ibasho for him if he feels relaxed or if he feels like this is you know, where he wants to spend time. Um, I remember I, um, as a child, uh, there was a playground very close to my uh, the apartment that I lived, and I often went there. There was a swing, there was sand, and I really liked spending a lot of time there because I would always find my friends who live in the same apartment complex, and the playground itself was not too far from the apartment, so, th so my parents, my family could still see me. Um, so it's not so that so then I could spend a lot of time until like dinner time, right? And I feel like, oh, this is my basho, and I, I would. Um, so there are all these multiple informal spaces uh, where the ch these children uh, feel um, sense of uh, safety or comfort. And um, one thing that I think that I also think is unique is that um, people don't talk about ibasho as um, if you have ibasho or if you don't have ibasho, but also talking about the process of creating ibasho. So anyone can create ibasho, right? So we we call it as ibasho zukuri, um, and a lot of actually um, community organizations or schools, educators, policymakers talk about how could we create ibasho. Right? Or how could we help support the youth or the children to create uh, ibasho? Um, so the, that process itself is very important and it's a practice-oriented term. So I think it's a very robust lens to unpack important physical spaces into, in children's everyday lives. Um, and it can be any um, place like a playground or it can be a community center, right? Or it can be a street corner or a dinner table even. Um, and then also understand about the emotional meanings uh, attached uh, to them. So I'll give you more examples um, from here. Um, so this um, study is a multi-sided ethnography uh, which examines the circulation of cultural meanings, objects, and identities in diffused time and space. And I focus on two groups of Asian immigrant teenage girls with different ethnicity, nationality, age of arrival, immigration history, language, and religion located in two distinct countries of Japan and the United States. Um, different from a traditional controlled comparative research, uh, this study focuses on non-matched populations in two countries and aims for interactive co-constitution of a cultural phenomenon. So while there is a profound diversity, right, among and within the two groups of girls, I believe that this diversity will deepen the understanding of the territorialization of culture, which in this case implies the meanings of home and ibasho for immigrant youth dispersed uh, in two localities. So what it means, right, for them to create homes in Ibasho um, as an immigrant girl. In order to understand important homes and Ibasho for immigrant girls who might not be able to fully articulate the important spaces in their lives, and it might be um, often invisible, I took a multi-instrumental approach such as participant observations formal interviews, informal ethnographic interviews, focus groups, online observation and engagement, and document collection. So I basically follow these girls. Uh, some of them call me a stalker because I would go to a mall with them. I would visit their homes, right? Or I would go to a school and, see, and meet their friends. So really tracing them from place to place. But I thought if I don't do that, I won't understand the important places in their daily lives. And they might not even articulate or they might uh, not notice some of the places that they think is important. Um, ethnographic uh, reflexivity, so my various identities, including race, ethnicity, nationality, language, class, gender, age, impacted the ways girls made sense of me and how I understood them uh, and the ways we built relationships. So I constantly reflected on my positionality and negotiated insider and outsider positions as different dimensions of my identities interacted with theirs. 
Um, and there was a lot of shifting positionality when I did my research in Japan and I did my research here in the United States. So in Japan, I was the majority Japanese with a middle class background, while the Filipina girls were profoundly marginalized as a Filipina girl and they were foreigners, right? So there was a lot of privilege, privilege that I uh, noticed. In the US, the girls and I shared an Asian identity uh, intersecting with the same gender identity, which often enabled me to relate to our common experience of being an Asian or an Asian girl or Asian woman. So they would always talk, uh, ask me, oh, you know, you're an Asian girl, so you're Asian or you're Asian, so you know how our parents are like, right? Or they <laughs> um, kind of feel like we have the similar experiences of having being an Asian and Asian woman. However, I was also aware of the privilege I had as a middle-class Japanese citizen compared to um, the girls coming uh, from developing countries um, in Asia. So it was interesting to understand um, the, the shifting uh, positionality. So the first group of girls are seven first-generation Filipina immigrant girls who I first met in 2005 at a Keaki Public Junior High School located in an urban area in Japan. 10% of the student population at this school were immigrant students, um, mostly of Chinese, Filipino, and Korean backgrounds. They had a Japanese language classroom, uh, which I'm calling JLC, where the students, uh, the immigrant students, especially the newly arrived ones, will be pulled out from the mainstream classroom to learn Japanese and some other subjects and get support from the Japanese teachers. Uh, most of the mothers of these girls uh, were single parents who immigrated to Japan to work as entertainers in the Japanese sex industry and left their children to be raised by uh, relatives in the Philippines uh, for most of their childhood. So they were raised by their grandmothers, aunts, right, the fe mostly female relatives, and they were separated from their mothers for a long time. Uh, and in their early teens, the girls were brought to Japan to live with their mothers who had later married Japanese men. And this migration has complex historical roots, which can be traced back to the Japanese history of sex tours to the Philippines in 1970s, and later a large influx of Filipinas into the Japanese sex industry during the 1980s and 90s. Due to this specific uh, context, the Filipina body has been hypersexualized in Japanese society because approximately 75% uh, currently of Filipinos in Japan are Filipina women who enter Japan under the immigration status of entertainers or as spouses of a Japanese man. Uh, due to this specific political and economic history between Japan and the Philippines, Filipino women's bodies often are represented and culturally read as sexually available. And the girls in my study had to navigate this context in their daily lives. Um, so when I hang out, uh, spend a lot of time with the, these girls, I was so struck by how many times uh, the girls will be approached um, by Japanese men, um, and a lot of times these men would, would uh, assume that these girls work in these Philippine pubs. So they would ask, like, immediately just seeing their face, right, their bodies, they would be ask, which pub do you work, right? Or you're so beautiful in Tagalog. And that was so profound. I was so shocked. I never had that experience living um, in Japan. So what it means to be a Filipina girl, young girl, uh, and what uh, if they get that kind of message in their daily lives, what kind of impact that will give uh, to these girls. And this is the um, uh, demographics of, of these girls. Um, so you could uh, read it. And my field uh, work uh, began at junior high school in 2005. And as I developed rapport with them, I shifted my field work outside of school and visited their homes and met their families, spent time with them in their neighborhoods. After they graduated from middle school, I continued to follow them and attended high school events, accompanied them to their jobs, uh, charge services, met their Filipino friends and youth network, and also visited the Philippines uh, twice um, to, to learn about their experiences before they came to Japan and also how they are uh, connected with their friends or families or even uh, the society, the community, uh, and having that transnational lives after um, they uh, come to Japan. So I stayed with them uh, and their relatives and their families' home. 
So the second group of girls are nine, first, 1.5, and second generation Asian immigrant high school girls ages 13 to 16. Three Filipinas, two J uh, Vietnamese, two Chinese, and one Indian who attended uh, Maple High. Uh, it's a U American public high school uh, on the East Coast. And the school is located in a suburb, and it has uh, recently has a, a large influx of Latino immigrants. And Maple High reflects the demographic uh, of that uh, uh, community, and it's about 46% Latino, 22% Black, 20% White, and 8% Asian. And all the girls attended um, an after-school program offered by Asian American Youth Organization, which I call AAYO. Uh, so I entered the field site through uh, AAYO's after-school program. And these girls are part of uh, post-1965 um, Asian immigrant wave. And some girls' families have been in the U.S. for 20 to 30 years, with many of their relatives having immigrated to the U.S. Um, while other, other girls are recent immigrants and are still in the process of bringing their family members to the U.S or some are part of the wave of Vietnamese refugees following the end of the Vietnam War in 1975. So it's very diverse, um, uh, thinking of the his immigration history and ethnicities. Um, and also a lot of them are working class um, backgrounds. So these girls, the Asian American immigrant girls um, in here, also struggle from racism, the model minority myth, uh, and perpetual outsider status. Um, and they were sexualized and hyperfeminized in the long history in the U.S., which have shaped um, their daily experiences. And young people are often stereotyped as intrinsically high-achieving, hardworking, committed to education um, because of the model minority stereotype um, that impact um, these uh, Asian uh, students. And sometimes underperforming students do not receive enough educational attention because the teachers, the adults, assume that they are smart, right? They could, they're doing well. And, and um, that can, um, so the students can be invisible uh, in discussions around the racism or, and, and they will be thought that they don't have any problems. And this is the demographics for the group of Asian American uh, immigrant girls. So I basically, uh, from 2011 to 2012, I uh, spent a lot of time at the AAYO's after school program. And also, as I developed rapport with the girls, um, I visited their homes, schools, neighborhoods, also had conversations with their families and friends. So notions of home and um, ibasho are very important in the context of displacement. Um, in interestingly, the group, both of the girls, um, the group of girls were talking um, about, uh, there was a similarity in how they talked uh, about uh, their family home experiences. So the, as girls growing up, um, they mentioned about parents' strict restrictions, right? I feel uh, stuck, at, stuck at home, or something that I often uh, heard, that there was a lot of curfew um, and uh, they were, the girls' uh, parents' surve surveillance due to concerns for the teenage daughter's safety and protection. And the girls' bodies were closely, strictly monitored and policed um, by their parents. Um, there was also increase in domestic responsibilities after they immigrated um, to, to the to host uh, society um, because both usually their both of their parents work for long hours. These girls were in charge of house chores, right, or taking care of younger siblings, so they had to stay at home and do a lot of these domestic responsibilities. Um, there was also a change in family membership, so usually um, in their homeland, they would spend a lot of time as, as, with their families, with a lot of relatives living together or in the same community. Um, but in, in the U.S. or in Japan, they were um, kind of, often by themselves or in a very small um, family setting. Uh, so Anna, a Filipina in Japan, would say they, they don't understand me, I don't like this family. So the, a lot of Fil the Filipina girls entered an unknown family, right? They, don't, they, didn't, they never met a Japanese father, right? They're not the biological father. So the, and then he even speaks different language. I, it's also difficult to communicate. They were also separated from their mothers for a long time. So like now they're living together as a teenager, <laughs> right? And also have um, siblings, have siblings. Um, um, there's a lot of contentious issue uh, with them as well. 
Uh, so just imagining that, uh, the context. It's the first time that I was home alone. In the Philippines, I was never home alone, um, Chell. So she's a Filipina in the US. But she said that there was um, Mays and all the relatives living together. So she never felt that. Um, but here, uh, she often spends her time by herself in her apartment. Uh, Nita, Indian girl, actually she's a second generation, but she said back home, we eat all the time together, always. Right, so every time she visits um, India with her family, there's a lot of family gatherings with so many people, relatives, uh, coming together and enjoying and feeling that connection, uh, which doesn't happen that often um, in the United States. There was a little bit uh, difference uh, in, in the school experiences. Um, so for the Japanese, the school in Japan, uh, the, many scholars mentioned how but values of cooperation, community, quality, and sameness is really important in Japanese schools. So usually there's a very strong assimilation pressure. So if you're a little bit different, if you a uh, returnee, if you're a foreigner, if, if you have a different mannerism, you might be policed, right, because of that differences. So the girls um, were target of that. Um, and uh, the second point, language barrier is very important, I think. So they never, they, it was their first time at the age of 13, 14 to learn Japanese, but everything, there's no English, right, or anything at school. So they had to learn a new language once they came to Japan and then take an entrance exam to go to high school, right? Um, so what that meant um, and how long it will take to learn Japanese uh, if you don't have that background. And Elena says, I want to make friends in my class, but my Japanese is not good, so I can't talk to anyone. I feel ashamed if I can't understand what they're talking about. So they often mentioned about the language issue and if, if, if it's even possible to learn Japanese and go through middle school, high school, and then maybe college or um, navigate that system was very difficult. Even though these Filipino girls speak multiple languages, they speak English, right? They also speak Tagalog and maybe other language, uh, other dialects from the Philippines, um, but very difficult. And there was also teachers negative stereotypes towards um, Filipino. In, in the school. Some teachers would say Filipino students are not hard workers comparing with uh, Chinese or Korean students. Uh, they're low achieving. There was a lot of, I think, negative um, uh, stereotypes um, and the students um, were um, listening uh, to those messages. So sense of isolation, alienation, and silence in mainstream classes. Of course, there were moments, right, at school that they feel comfortable, but in the main, especially in the mainstream classes, uh, class settings, um, there was a lot of alienation. And in, in, in the US, um, Asian immigrant girls also struggled to find Ibasho in the formal classes. Uh, values of multiculturalism and racial and ethnic, ethnic diversity was very important in the school. Uh, the school itself was a very ethnically, racially diverse um, school. So the students were really proud of that diversity, were very diverse. The school itself is very diverse. Um, but there was a lot of policing among racially segregated groups. I think um, many of you maybe experienced it in your high school, um, but there's white group and Latino group and um, black group and not much of an interaction uh, among each other or maybe make a more of a racially mixed group. Uh, so the students sometimes um, talked about how it's difficult to connect with these um, different uh, segregated groups. Um, and the second issue is um, the percentage of Asians, right? So in this school, it was 8%. So there weren't many Asian students around, and also there was only one Asian teacher. They always complained to me, there's only one, right? Like, why aren't there Asian adults around us? So very difficult to connect with the teachers as well as um, students, and also the profound model minority myth in this school as well. Um, so Gina, a second generation Chinese girl, says it's really boring and most of the time I'm, I'm alone, I don't have many friends in those classes. Or Zuli, a um, Filipina girl, says they, non-Asian students, are always like, you're Asian, you can do that, right? I'm like, not really. So this is a good example of the model minority myth. Um, some of the girls would say, oh, they just asked me to do all the projects because they think I'm smart because I'm Asian <laughs> and they don't really know. Um, so, um, like that kind of message was pretty um, prevalent in their daily lives. So less uh, racial and ethnic affirmation, so being Asian and having that affirmation, um, and being invisible and silent in formal classes, in some classes. So, um, 
In the midst of um, negotiating displacement, um, both groups of girls built uh, multiple homes uh, globally and Ibasho locally, however minute and temporary they could be. So this is what I'm really focusing on, right? Um, how they built um, homes in Ibasho. So I divided into global and local, but actually they are interrelated. So there's a lot of um, connection among the two. But the girls um, imagined um, future home um, in the U.S. and Japan. So the girls in, in, in Japan uh, would imagine the U.S. as their future home and vice versa. Or there's also virtual diasporic communities that they created that went across national borders. Um, and locally, um, the school, so even though there were a lot of spaces they, they felt alienated, there were uh, spaces that they created that they felt they were, uh, that was their ibasho. Right, so for example, JLC, Japanese language classroom hallway, right, a hallway where they could gather, that could be their ibasho, or um, school basement hallway for the Asian immigrant girls, actually. It was very similar how they kind of um, declare those spaces. And also AYO's after school program. Um, in the neighborhood, um, there was internet cafe, fast food restaurants, so the girls, the Filipino girls would often go to these cafes to connect. Um, virtually with their friends, uh, Filipino friends in other countries, or streets uh, near the train station, bus stops. Maybe you don't really pay attention to these places, but actually that was a very important places for them to gather and do some things that they felt proud of, right? Or a mall or grocery stores, park. These are some examples. And for family home, uh, on the bed, they often talked about my bed is really important. I could do, I could feel comfortable, right? I could use my iPhone to connect with people, to communicate, feel a sense of community. Also family time, that didn't happen that often. Very um, rare, but still those times were really important for them. So these were some um, examples of um, their ibasho and home. So I'm going to explain a little bit more in detail using some of the examples. So the girls um, transformed um, geographically marginal uh, space at school and turned it into their ibasho, right? So if you hear about a hallway, <laughs> that's a marginal space. Not, they, you might think that's not an important space, but actually the girls often spend a lot of time. So the Filipino girls in Japan would gather at the JLC hallway. Whenever I go to that school, I would see them, right? dancing or talking in border tongue, a mix of Filipino or Japanese or English, uh, or sing uh, hybrid songs, uh, Filipino pop music, American pop music, the Japanese pop music, or perform hip hop dance. They were practicing hip hop in the, in the hallway and kind of dominating uh, the hallway. And they really loved that moment. And that was their ibasho. Um, and the girls in the U.S. similarly actually um, gathered at the school basement hallway um, during lunchtime with diverse friends from various um, different race, different class, different language um, backgrounds, and they, they call themselves as a basement group because they always gather at the basement. And they, really, they were really proud of being in that space. As uh, Gina, the Chinese girl, says, we dominate the basement. And I was so struck by this word because I never think of dominate and abasement together, right? But, so, but they reclaimed and they kind of turned this space, the marginal space, into a space where they feel powered or empowered or um, declaring um, that space. Um, the girls also appropriated pockets of public space. Um, so the girls in Japan, um, uh, I often hang out with them, so I would follow them after school, right? Where did they go? They would take a bus. And they often went to a nearby mall um, to actually play um, hip hop music using speaker connected to iPod and practice dance routines in front of a department store window that doubled as a mirror. Right? It was very powerful to see them doing that. And they also created some poses as a group and took many pictures and then uploaded on uh, social networking sites. And many Japanese would pass by, the strangers would pass by and they would stare at them. But they did not seem to care. Right? They were, um, so uh, there was some kind of empowerment, empowerment through those gazes of strangers and engaged in their dance and music and claimed the space as their ibasho, and they, it was very important for them um, to turn into these, these public spaces um, into, uh, into ibasho. 
And the girls in the U.S. All similarly hang out at a pockets of, um, um, they also often mentioned about walking to the uh, nearby, nearby mall after school, right? So they would always go there. And um, they will be like, oh, you should, all, you, know, you should come to our mall with us, right? That was their, they were claiming, they were own, owning <laughs> that mall and asked me to come. Uh, so I, I sometimes went with them. And I was so struck by how they were sophisticated in finding pockets of Asianized. So this is, these, these are their words. They said Japanified spaces where they sell like anime um, products, right? Like cute, anime, like Hello Kitty products. Um, or all these different um, Japanese um, anime manga characters, and they love to engage with these products. And they knew all these different shops and uh, very specific locations, sections where they sold these places, uh, where they sold these goods, and they could like wear um, the Hello Kitty book bag or wear the T-shirt and take pictures, and they never purchase. But like engaging with these commodities were really important for them in these malls. Um, and they would always, um, um, they would sometimes say, oh, you're so Asian by um, wearing these Hello <laughs> Kitty um, uh, book bags or like, T-shirts and kind of claiming and kind of reaffirming um, their Asianness. And um, also the girls uh, was also related to their femininity, right? So wearing these kawaii products were the, was one of their way um, of their ideal, um, to be an ideal um, uh, constructing girlhood. Um, for them. So there are also a lot of examples, but because of the time, um, I wouldn't go too deep. Um, so the girls transform regulated local spaces into ibasho where they feel a sense of community, self, and empowerment. And the, since I followed them from space to face, I, space, um, it was very uh, empowering to see how they were very different, right, from in, when they were in formal classes and when they were at the mall, right? Um, and physical visibility um, and a different embodiment was very profound. Uh, through curving out multiple ibasho, the marginalized girls developed identity and belonging and affirmed hybrid cultures, which might not be um, respected in, in or appreciated in their in the schools, and also languages to maneuver a new land. But there was also non-ibasho aspects, right? So these spaces are not permanently ibasho. They sometimes changed. From, so the girls in the U.S. would say, oh, we are, always, we are often kicked out from the basement space, right? Sometimes the teachers would say, oh, you're so loud, you should you know, get out of this space, and then they have to move. But then they always tell me, oh, we always come back. We never like, leave, leave permanently, right? Um, so thinking about adult surveillance, right? Uh, vulnerable to oppression, the Filipino girls in, the, in front of the department store, there will be a lot of strangers coming in. Uh, so they have to be aware of that, and border policing among each other, right? They would say things um, to each other. So to, just to know about the negative aspects, um, the difficulty in, of these IPA shows. The girls also created imagined future home across Japan and the United States. Um, so they were, I was, they were very um, sophisticated in enacting their agency to imagine, right? multiple uh, imagined homes um, globally. So Tan is a Vietnamese girl in the US, and she, she went to a high school here, uh, and, but, but she saw Japan as her future home, not the US, right? So she would say, I'm definitely going to Japan. And it's not just a, her um, fantasy, but she, was, she uh, actually learned Japanese, so she would always talk to me in a mix of Japanese and English, right? She know a lot of details about the Japanese society through watching Japanese um, TV shows or movies. Um, also, she's mentioned that Japan and Vietnam share the same Asian culture. So, I, so she feels very close to Japan, right? Um, because of that Asianness, and maybe the racialization of being an Asian in the United States helped her to see more of the connection with Japan. Uh, Cherry, a Filipina girl in Japan, uh, on the other hand, saw the U.S. as our future home. Actually, this was pretty common with a lot of Filipina girls that they they said that, oh, Japan is only a stepping stone. <laughs> We're not going to be here for a long time. We're going to move to the US, that's the goal, that's the destination, right? Because we're fluent in English, they learn English in their home country in the Philippines, right? So, and then they were also immersed with 
uh, American uh, cultures of popular music uh, from the TV and everything, the media. So they, could, they knew a lot, and they also had a lot of relatives or their friends in, in, in the United States. Um, so they could see themselves. They, they saw that they thought that they will have a better future in the US, and America is like a dreamland, right? Um, that they, they saw. So this is not a passive enactment to escape that they didn't like their lives in Japan or the US, but, but an active agency to curb out promising future uh, globally. So continuously trying to find out a place that will give them a better future. And it was very powerful to see that. And the last example of creating homes globally is this um, Asian diasporic communities. Um, so the girls um, used the cyberspace um, to uh, be connected with um, the with youth globally, right? It wasn't just con in, uh, contained in the nation state. So virtual LGBTQ uh, Asian community, the Filipina girl, uh, Elena, uh, she identified herself as as a uh, um, lesbian, and she said uh, she would go to internet cafe to to connect with her uh, Filipina LGBT community online. And she had some specific friends in Malaysia, right, in the United States, uh, in Japan, and uh, support each other. She would get a lot of information from each other, communicate, she would sometimes Skype, right? There was a lot of connection um, to them. And she felt like this is a community that I belong, this is my home, right? And the second example is imagined pan-Asian community. So the girls, um, were very into Asian popular culture, as I mentioned. And it wasn't only consuming these Asian popular culture, but they also imagined this pan-Asian community that was uh, Asian American community and Asians, the Asian country. Like it was uh, both of them, right? So, so Mino, who's a Vietnamese girl in the US says, it's like a pride, like you're proud to be Asian and you're proud of other Asians in Asia representing who they are and all. So I thought it was a very powerful statement that maybe a lot of Asians in Asia don't even think that they're Asian, like in Asian, right? Um, but because they are in the United States, right, and they, they have this racial racialization of being Asian that um, they could imagine their own uh, way of um, connecting with this uh, pan-Asian communities. Um, and this is a, a picture that I brought from Nita, who's a second generation Indian girl. And she said she drew this, um, the girl in the middle, um, in a very sad face at, at like midnight, right? And she drew, started drawing it in, in pencil, and, and she's like soaked, right? She's all wet and looked very sad. So she said she added all these Asian um, anime characters around to cheer her up. That's her, how she said. Right, to give life to her, to empower her. So it also tells how these, these Asian products for her uh, was empowering and gave some hope, right? Uh, even momentarily. Uh, so I use also a lot of artwork um, to understand lives and how they created these spaces. So the girls rebordered, reclaimed, and reconstructed national, regional, ethnic, and cultural borders to construct um, diasporic um, homes. So then what could we learn from these girls' lives? Um, Asian immigrant girls in Japan and the US um, are cultural mediators, uh, diasporic Asians, and global community builders who negotiate this location and attachment in an interconnected world. So they had enormous amount of agency and what they could do, um, the non-traditional way of uh, imagining, right, and believing and becoming. And the girls learned to manage um, the struggles of immigration as an Asian woman in the United States, right, as a Filipina girl um, in, in Japan. And there were a, a lot of uh, the difficulties that they have. Um, but they m figure out how to, how to manage that. They also developed uh, flexible identities and also future, imagined future belonging, adjust to their in-between lives through carving out multiple homes and ibasho. And possibility of a hybrid concept of home and ibasho. Since I grew up in both Japan and the US, um, I use both of the concepts, I think, in myself. I often think, because I was, um, I was crossing these borders so many times. So, and whenever I enter a new land, it was so important for me to build Iwasho, 
right? To build where I could belong or feel a connection to people. So the, this lens, and I realized that these lens, and using both lens, home and Ivasho, um, help us to um, unpack and capture these often unknown um, and undiscussed uh, sites of belonging uh, for immigrant youth. So it kind of complement each other. That home, if I'm just only using home, it won't, but if I use both, right, uh, it will um, capture more of expansive understandings of home and Russia. Um, the interconnection among Im immigrant youth. So the media and technology facilitate uh, connection among youth uh, globally. So it wasn't only youth in one country, right? but immigrant youth in multiple countries. And, and these, I think, media and technology, there's a lot of neg negative sides to it, but, but when, when you see from their perspective, it allowed them to create communities that went beyond a national um, boundaries. And that could also alter and expand the ways to build sites of belonging and empowerment. And lastly, these are some possible questions um, for educators and practitioners, because I, I, I think, we really need to change right, um, the way we educate people and also how we build schools and programs. And I, I'm continuously thinking about these questions. Right? What are some important characteristics of Ibasho and homes um, created by, by youth? And how could we build on their strength and assets to transform often alienating and exclusive mainstream spaces into Ibasho? Um, how could we support youth to foster the development of Iwasho where they can thrive? So, it's, so we not, adults can't decide what is Iwasho for youth. The children and youth have to understand, they have to define this is my Iwasho or not, right? So what are some ways for, for um, the educators to create some spaces or to foster um, the development of Iwasho for youth? And we need to think it together and really try to understand um, how children and young people are experiencing, right, and building um, homes in Iwasho. So I think that's the end of the presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, questions? Is there a microphone? You need to speak loud. Uh, it seems like uh, in the word you have the whole bunch of psychological concepts. And um, depression, anxiety, feeling of alien. Excuse me. Um, in, in the word Ibashu, you, you have um, couched a lot of concepts of um, a young Asian woman feeling, um, you know, like a sex object and uh, smart. I mean, the total label and kind of generalization that uh, we have. And also the, a lot of psychological issues that they might go through, but you haven't touched on that. Mm -hmm. Is that on purpose? Um, in relation to Ibasho or? In the relation to what the person experiences mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, are, they, are they looking for that Ibasho or sense of home and sense of belonging because of what they feel or is it a, you know, I mean, like a transition. I was, mm -hmm. I was hoping that we could hear Mm -hmm. a little bit more on, on that part. Mm. So, Ibasho, Both in Japan and the US. Yeah, so Ibasho, I actually didn't mention this today, but uh, actually Ibasho, we often use this um, also for, um, we don't, the phrase Ibasho ga nai, like we don't have Ibasho, right? It's not only just um, talking about where is the place I belong, but also the sense of not feeling that I have connection to people or feel like I'm not, understood by people or affirmed by people. So um, that term itself, I think, is very interesting to think about um, the, the state of not feeling um, having a community, right? And uh, of course, that is deeply connected. So the, the media representation of Asian women in the US is deeply connected to how they need to create these uh, sites of belonging. So there's a lot of connection. It's kind of embedded in, in the context, how, how they create homes. Um, yeah. And also the Filipina girls in Japan too. Other questions? 
Right here, yeah. Okay. Hi. Okay. Hi. Um, I was wondering if um, whether uh, for the girls in the U.S., if they ever had any experiences um, with children of Asian immigrants, so children that were born in the U.S. to Asian immigrants, because those their experiences mm -hmm. will be different because they grew up in the U.S., but their parents were Asian immigrants, so they have that connection. And um, I was wondering if that sort of had any kind of impact on the um, the girls' creation of Ibasho. So the difference between the girls who were born in the U.S. and who grew up in the U.S., and also the girls who maybe migrated at the age of 12 or after they, so th who have both um, experiences, right? Yes, and if they were, if they had any sort of encounters together, like in school, if... Um, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a great question. So th um, the difficulty of this was um, I mentioned a lot about the Asian girls as a whole, but actually there's so much diversity within this, um, the Asian immigrant girls, the second generation, right, who were born in the U.S. and who maybe never been to their parents' homeland. Uh, so maybe they feel like they want to know more about their roots or their connection, right, or know more about the history of immigration or about their parents' homeland compared to the recent immigrants. Uh, who already have a lot of a tie, tie or ha have a connection um, and maybe have even have friends in, in um, the countries back home. So how they imagined home was also very different. And one thing that I realized was that second generation girls who were born here were more um, into um, Asian popular culture. Like that was the way for them to feel that they are Asian, right? Or feel like uh, it gave them resources, I think, to understand a, diff uh, a language from an Asian country, um, which I didn't see that much with the newer immigrants. And there were other yeah, differences as well. Yeah, but thank you for that. Hi, thank you. Um, in the beginning, you mentioned that most people are aware of the term abasho. And I was wondering if with any of the particular Japanese American immigrants, if knowing that word and being aware of it gave them a more nuanced and maybe easier transition to creating their own abasho um, compared to just the term of home, which might be more structured and therefore not as easily made? That's a great question. <laughs> um, yeah, well, actually, I didn't have any Japanese immigrants in my research, and I never, like, talked about Ibasho to the girls that I was working for this research, but actually, once I realized that, oh, this Ibasho, the concept of Ibasho is really helpful, because I often, like, intentionally think about how could I make Ibasho, right? And I kind of started to line up, list all these meanings, because it was so un un intentional for me. Like, I just did it automatically. So, for my current research, I'm working with a Chinese immigrant um, youth, Chinese immigrant uh, first generation youth, and I'm teaching them this concept of ibasho. And then, like, we talk about, um, like, what are some important, like, the time is important, right? Like, with the space where you feel comfortable, the relationship. And um, I'm doing a lot of, like, talking and also using posters for them to make, um, make that visible. Right? Like what, what, what kind of ibasho they have and then how could they expand more ibasho? How could they make more ibasho in a new land? And they said that it was helpful. So I'm not sure, I'm like trying to ex uh, introduce this concept more in English so that, or, and also in Japan, in Japan I'm doing that too. Um, but yeah, uh, the practicality and knowing that, right? I think it will help you to adapt. I actually do that for my work as well, to talking about it to an international student, a college student. So thank you. One more. I'm an American who lived in Asia for over 25 years. Um, and as an introduction to my question, I will tell you that I think that Hello Kitty and the popularity is one of the great five mysteries of the world for Westerners. <laughs> um, and and it, it leads me to the question about cultural overlays on mm -hmm. what you're talking about, because you've got this question of the immigrant uh, girls in Japan 
and the immigrant girls or second generation girls in America. Mm -hmm. And you may tell me this is a myth, but the sense we have is that the Japan is much more homogenous and much more difficult for immigrants to be able to settle in relative to the United States. And mm -hmm. I wonder how that uh, factored into your, into your thinking of contrasting one to the other. Mm, the homogeneity of Japan. Yeah, I think um, even though we, Japan is becoming more and more diverse um, and there is, um, you know, various minority groups um, and um, different immigrants uh, coming in. And I think recently there is a lot of change in the school system as well and having more classes and for um, these immigrant youth. Um, but I still think that um, not the percentage, right, of immigrant students in one school is not too high. So usually it's less than like maybe 5% um, of the students who are immigrant backgrounds. Uh, that I think definitely affects uh, how the students could create community. So the Filipino girls would always um, be together as, as a Filipino community in this, in this large school, even though there were some immigrants uh, from other countries. Um, but in, in the US, even though there were a lot of newly immigrants, um, the girls that I um, introduced today um, created this diverse group. And I wonder if that will happen, right, um, in, in Japan. And they were so proud of that. Um, the multicultural uh, aspects of their community that they created. And I think that is also very specific to, to the American um, um, the context. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Takanaka. Thank you.